Uh, can you tell me the other thing? I, I want to know about the, the, the liver product, uh, the one that, for liver function. One of the main uh, diseases that has been, or syndromes, that it's not really pegged as a disease, that has become recognized over the past several years is the uh, infiltration of the liver with uh, fat. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, this can occur, you know, it's long been known that that occurs with uh, heavy use of alcohol, but that, uh, but that that's something which has uh, been achieved through uh, uh, excess eating as well. And, and, and in fact, a lot of normal weight people have been found to have liver fat, just for example, in car accidents and stuff. So uh, over the past several years, it's become evident that this uh, liver fat is the precursor for a lot of problems with the liver, as well as other metabolic diseases leading to diabetes and uh, uh, ultimately to liver failure. And uh, there are a lot of different processes that are involved in, in uh, the uh, development of liver fat, one of the most important being the actual production of new uh, uh, triglyceride or uh, fat within the liver. And the, the liver product functions in a few different ways, most prominently in terms of the specific amino acids uh, that uh, can actually inhibit the synthesis of new dietary fat in the liver. And that's the basis for uh, decreasing liver fat, which we've shown to uh, be effective uh, and result of uh, alcohol consumption, as well as what we call NASH or non-alcoholic steatosis, which uh, is in uh, which, which we recently completed a study in in young adolescent females with uh, um, what's called polycystic uh, syndrome uh, that that have a, uh, a deposition of liver fat, and and in a large group. That oh. polycystic, that polycystic fibrosis, it, don't they, isn't there a big case of, uh, I mean, uh, aren't they usually obese and it, yeah, that causes exactly. the obesity? Yeah. Right. And, uh, and even normal weight, older individuals turn out to have a, an increase in liver fat just because of the function of growing older and that we were able to drop the liver fat in half, uh, with, uh, uh, 12 week, tr uh, treatment with, uh, the wow. amino acid formulation. So we can do wow. this without any risk at all. Uh, no medication. And, and uh, it, it, it is focused on uh, manipulating the metabolic state of the liver. And this is an example of what we're saying that these combinations of essential amino acids have functions throughout the whole body. And this is a product that's not particularly uh, promoting muscle, it's promoting uh, a reduction of liver fat through the uh, different combination of amino acids. So how come, uh, so you have to have a patent for this. One of the arguments always is like with, with supplementation or herbs or whatever is Chinese herbs is that they don't require uh, a patent uh, and pharmaceuticals do. Pharmaceuticals get a patent like with something like NAC, which NAC is just amino, amino acid, is it not? I'm not familiar with NAC. Um, uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, oh, and adenosine, the acetyl coat. Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, the patents can be two forms. One is that it's a unique formulation, that it's a chemical that you've made up yourself and uh, uh, it's a unique chemical. Uh, another is uh, the application of something that's well established for a particular syndrome or disease so that you could get a patent on an herb if you had some unique application of it that no one had ever thought of and that, uh, uh, you know, it's, you're not making a new chemical, but it's actually uh, a new application of something that's well established. So, uh, you know, those are the two categories. In our case that, uh, uh, you know, our patents are predicated on, an, on a new formulation of combination of essential amino acids that have a specific metabolic effect. What, but my, what I mean there is what's the difference between when does it become a pharmaceutical and when does it stay a supplement or it, what is the difference there? Yeah, the FDA determines that and it can, you know, it, it ranges drastically from uh, one compound to another. And it depends a lot on uh, if there are treatments for the uh, problem uh, and if the treatments have no side effects and if they already have an effective treatment 
uh, then then it's much harder to get FDA approval. So okay. a, a supplement can have a patent, but not FDA approval. Mm -hmm. uh, you will not have anything with FDA approval that doesn't have a patent because the FDA approval is a much longer uh, pathway. The, uh, the, uh, the regulations on a dietary supplement primarily revolve around advertising and what you're entitled to say about the product sure, based sure. on what research is available. Okay. Um, so for the average person out there, I want to do the average person, the athlete, and an elderly person, what should they be doing on a regular basis uh, using, let's, let's say, using your product? What would you recommend for the average person? Uh, how much, how often, which products? Well, the general guideline would be uh, a, 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 a good, that the baseline is a good, healthy diet with high quality proteins, uh, that, uh, that uh, exercise should definitely be incorporated into daily activities. And, and it, with an older person, that may involve nothing more than walking, uh, but uh, uh, exercise training is certainly important. The uh, dosage, we take someone that's doing a workout in the morning would be taking the uh, two two uh, two two uh, scoopfuls of the perform before and during the exercise, and two scoopfuls of heal after the exercise. And if the goal is to build your muscle mass, more uh, heal later in the day. Uh, if it's just to improve muscle function, which is usually the case if you're doing aerobic training, then the uh, dosage before and after workout will not increase your muscle mass, but increase the uh, functional capacity without really affecting the mass. So that the so, amount of heal depends on how, what your goal is, if it's to develop more muscle mass or not. But that's the general guideline is two scoops before exercise, two scoops afterwards. And if you're not exercising that day, uh, at least two scoops of the heel between meals. So you're saying for, for someone that's looking to build muscle mass, two performance before, two scoops after, and then two even later in the day. Yeah. Okay. 